Hello everyone, I hope you enjoy and get the most out of this mini lecture video. In the last mini lecture video, we discussed the topic of pseudo or fake science. In this video, we start with a related but different concept, fraudulent and unethical research. In 1998, a study that would forever change public perception about vaccines was published in the renowned medical journal The Lancet by Dr. Andrew Wakefield, a British gastroenterologist. His study of 12 autistic children falsely claimed a link between the measles, mumps, and rubella MMR vaccine and autism, a topic that you may have heard about in recent years. Wakefield promoted the idea that the same measles virus found in the MMR vaccine caused the quote-unquote leaky gut, sending toxic substances into the bloodstream and ultimately the brain, thus resulting in the autistic syndrome. Following a lengthy hearing spanning several years, in 2010, the UK General Medical Council ruled against Wakefield, who was subsequently stripped of his medical license. The paper that described his research study was retracted from The Lancet in the same year due to ethical violations and scientific misrepresentation. What it seems Wakefield failed to disclose about his study was, for starters, his financial interests. There was evidence that his research had been funded by lawyers representing parents who were suing vaccine-producing companies. Wakefield was also found guilty of ethical violations because he conducted invasive investigations on the children without obtaining the necessary ethical clearances, such as approval by the hospital's ethics committee, appropriate pediatric qualifications, proper disclosure of recruitment procedures, etc. Finally, the General Medical Council found that Wakefield scientifically misrepresented his research, including the fact that the supposed association between vaccination and autism was based primarily on parental recall. Since then, the Institute of Medicine of the United States National Academy of Sciences, along with the CDC and the UK National Health Service, have reviewed hundreds of epidemiological and biological studies for any link between vaccines and autism, and have determined that there is no evidence of a causal relationship between MMR vaccines and autism. So, why are we still talking about Wakefield's autism research? And why are parents still afraid of vaccinating their children for fear of this precise outcome? There are several reasons as to why child vaccination is controversial, but Wakefield's ideas also persisted in the public's mind in large part due to, quote, science by press conference, unquote, campaigns, their endorsement by authority figures such as celebrities, and the spurious temporal relationship between vaccines and the usual age of onset of autistic symptoms. More importantly for this course, Wakefield's study is a sore reminder of what type of research we want to avoid. So, what constitutes ethical research? Psychologists and other researchers are obligated to follow ethical principles when designing their studies, recruiting participants, and publishing their findings. But the specific standards haven't always been the same, or even been in place for some classic psychology experiments. Take Stanley Milgram's 1963 obedience study, Philip Zimbardo's 1971 Stanford Prison Experiment, or the deeply regrettable decades-long Tuskegee syphilis experiment on African-American men in Alabama. Many questionable practices were employed in these studies, such as excessive deception of participants, undue stress and emotional hardship, and unclear or non-existent consenting, withdrawing, and debriefing procedures. These studies would not be allowed to take place today, thanks to the ensuing 1978 Belmont Report issued by the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. The report sets forth three basic ethical principles, respect for persons, which involves a recognition of the personal dignity and autonomy of individuals, and special protection of those persons with diminished autonomy. In psychological research, we abide by this principle through the need to obtain informed consent from participants and allow them to withdraw their participation, something that was held from the Tuskegee men. Beneficence, which entails an obligation to protect persons from unjustifiable harm by maximizing anticipated benefits and minimizing possible risks. Here, researchers need to engage in a risk-benefit analysis, something that was also absent from the Tuskegee trials and Wakefield's autism research, and was questionable in Milgram's and Zimbardo's experiments. Finally, justice requires that the benefits and burdens of research be distributed fairly. This means that subjects must be fairly selected, which was clearly not the case in the Tuskegee trials or in Wakefield's research. 
The American Psychological Association has its own ethics code, which largely follows from the Belmont Report and is periodically revised. In fact, as a result of allegations of torture and illegal interrogations of post-9-11 detainees in places like Guantanamo by psychologists working with the CIA, in 2008, the APA issued a new policy stating that psychologists may not work in settings where persons are held outside of or in violation of either international law or the U.S. Constitution. Therefore, in the U.S., research involving human subjects has to be approved by what we call an institutional review board. An IRB is in charge of approving research in, say, health institutes, universities, and pharmaceutical companies. The IRB review serves as an important role in the protection of human research subjects, and studies may fall into one of three categories. Exempt level review, which requires no informed consent. Examples are anonymous surveys, observation of public behavior, or archival research. Exempt does not mean that the study is exempt from IRB review. Rather, it is conducted by one IRB member. Next is the expedited level review, where risks are minimal, such as in the collection of samples and data in a manner that is non-anonymous and that involves no more risk than in activities of daily life. An example would be a biopsychology study conducting physiological recordings of participants' brain responses with EEG or fMRI. Finally, full board level reviews required for studies that present more than minimal risk to subjects, such as most drugs and medical devices, and or studies that involve vulnerable populations, such as children, prisoners, institutionalized individuals, or persons with diminished capacity to consent, for example, Alzheimer's patients. And what about animals, you ask? This brings us to our final and very controversial topic, which is animal research. We owe much to our furry friends, mice, rats, cats, and dogs, in the way of scientific knowledge obtained from experimentation on them. While an RRB is for protection of human subjects only, most animal research is supervised by what we call an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, made up of at least one scientist, veterinarian, and one community member. Nevertheless, animal research is a sensitive topic that tends to firmly place people in two opposing camps. The minimalists who support animal research that is regulated by IACUCs in accordance with the Animal Welfare Act and which minimizes pain, illness, and discomfort. And in the other camp, the abolitionists who are against all and any animal research and claim that this constitutes speciesism or exploitation of animals. And that's it for this mini lecture video. After reviewing it and going over your course materials, you should be able to describe and critically evaluate Milgram's obedience experiment, explain the rationale behind APA ethical guidelines for human research, evaluate research studies in light of IRB approval levels, and argue both sides of the debate on use of animals in research. I will catch you on the next lecture video.